Have you ever wanted to write a book? If you're like most 20-somethings, you probably have. But the problem is getting published is a pain in the ass. But it doesn't have to be a problem because, in fact, self-publishing is not going to only make your life easier. You're actually going to make more money by self-publishing than going the traditional route of getting a big publisher to back you. I love doing this episode, and Simon from Rocking Self-Publishing joins me, and we talk all kinds of things, everything you'd want to know about how to write a book and how to self-publish. It's a super information-packed episode. And if you do have a goal such as writing a book or getting published, I highly recommend checking out the hidden episode that I did because I did, I did an entire episode on the science of how to set and achieve goals. And you can get that totally for free by going to howtodoyour20s.com, putting your email in the top little box, hitting accept, of course, and I'll send you an email with that episode that's all about how to set and achieve your goals. And I go into detail on how to use science in for your advantage and in your favor so that you can meet and set whatever goal you possibly could want to. But now let's get into the actual episode. Welcome to another episode of the How to Do Your 20s podcast. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about self-publishing. And I have Simon Whistler from the Rocking Self-Publishing podcast with us. And we're going to talk all kinds of cool tips and tricks in this episode. So Simon, first off, thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure, Travis. It's great to be here. How did you get into self-publishing? Uh, kind of a long story. Um, well, it depends how you're looking at it. We're probably doing about 30 seconds, right? Uh, I was originally working as a audiobook narrator because I had recently graduated university. It was kind of 2009, not exactly the most brilliant job market in the world. I Googled, how can I make money with my voice? Because people had said, oh, Simon, you have quite a nice voice. You could do something with your voice. Went from there to narrating audiobooks for an agency. So they accepted my tape, which I really did record on a $15 microphone. And they were like, you can read this book on that book. And they were really dry. Don't go and listen to them. Don't go to Audible, search me, and then buy something from like three years ago because it's, yeah, it's dull. Uh, I went from there to doing more interesting stuff, myself pitching indie authors who were self-published saying, hey, do you want to make an audiobook? And we'll split the proceeds. And from there, I kind of got involved with the industry, realized I had a pretty cool Rolodex of contacts. I was like, I should talk to some of these people in a podcast because I was a massive podcast consumer. I think we met because of the Tropical MBA podcast and or the group associated with that. And then, yeah, just fired it off a podcast and kind of 18 months later, here I am, 85 shows in and yeah, it's been a blast. So I guess the big question is, why self-publishing over traditional publishing? Well, when I wanted to kind of get started in this, I was looking at, you know, who can I narrate for? And you can't really send a letter to Random House and say, I'd like to read this book because they have process and systems and all of that. Whereas self-publishers, they get to do it all themselves. So if, I mean, I've put out a book since then. And so if someone sent me an email and said, hey, I want to do the audio book version, you know, the self-publisher has all the rights so they can do whatever they want with that the audio rights. And if they, you know, if I sent them a good sample or whatever, they'd be like, sure, let's do it. And yeah, that's how I got there. How does, how does it work with physical books? Do you pay for the physical books? Like if you want to print out physical books, if you're doing self-publishing? A couple of options. The main one is to go through Create Space, which is an Amazon company. So most people will do kind of the ebook version, pop it up on Amazon, but then you can pay or do your print formatting yourself. Uh, it's, it's not expensive, maybe a hundred or 200 bucks. And that person will take your ebook and make it into a print book. You also need to get your cover designer to kind of do, because the basic cover design packages usually just include the front of the book because that's all that an ebook needs. You know, it appears on Amazon, it's your thumbnail, you're all good to go. But when you get a print book done, you obviously need the spine, you need the back, and that's put together with the print formatting. You send that off to create space and then... Basically, I think how it works is you can set the price on Amazon and then from CreateSpace, it's, it's a few dollars. I don't know the exact pricing because I haven't done a print book yet, but I think it's like three to five to six bucks and you can get the books at cost. So you can order them on demand. So there's no filling your garage with 2,500 books like you used to have to do. It's, the main way is you put the book on Amazon and if someone buys a print copy, it's printed by CreateSpace and sent off on demand, no huge upfront costs. So really easy to get a print book done. Wow. And, and I, it, it, also awesome because then you're like, I wrote a book and it's not on my Kindle, it's in my hand and that's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've always thought if I write a book, it's like you kind of want to be able to give them to people and it's great to have an ebook, but 
for some reason, it just doesn't seem as real as being able to hold it in your hand. So true. And I, they've really come a long way. Like it used to be kind of flimsy, white paged kind of paper bags, which clearly kind of smell of you didn't have a big print run. But now it's kind of they have these beautiful yellow pages, you know, like you get in a real, you know, real paperback and doing the air quotes there. <laughs> and um, you get matte covers. So they kind of soft to the touch and really what create space are doing now go for the matte covers because the glossy ones they're not as cool but you get this matte cover book and i've seen some people like i went to a, a book fair and there were the self-publishers there and they're like you could not tell these books apart from something from a traditional press if they had good covers of course <laughs> That's awesome. So we talked a couple advantages of self-publishing. Uh, most importantly, that you have all the control. Is there any other really big advantages of self-publishing? Yeah, 70%. <laughs> um, you go with the traditional press, you're looking at, and the figures vary, but typically kind of 7 to 15%, 15% way high end um, of the ticket price. So if that book and that might, sorry, that might not even be the ticket price. It might be the book, the price that the bookstore buys it from the publisher for. So you're looking at less than 10% of the sale price of the book landing in your pocket. I mean, if you're a new author, forget the advance. It's probably not going to happen. If it is, it's going to be small. And if you don't want to think that small. With self-publishing, you go through Amazon, you price it between $2.99 and $9.99, and you get to keep 70% of that money minus a tiny amount for digital delivery. But I mean, really 70% is the figure you're looking at. If you price it less than $2.99, you still get 35%. If you price it over $9.99, uh, $9 you get 35%. But I mean, the vast majority of people will publish between $2.99 and $9.99 just because it's so, you know, 70%. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. So it's a you, huge difference. Yeah, if you have a ten dollar book and it's selling in like a Barnes and Noble or something like that with traditional publishing, you only get a dollar or more or less as an author. I'd say less than a dollar. Yeah, less than a dollar. Jesus, I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's 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 low. Um, it obviously depends what you negotiate and what your agent would negotiate and all of that stuff. But it's it's really insignificant compared to self publishing. What about what are some disadvantages of self publishing? Got to do it all yourself. Um, <laughs> You got to, and this, this, this is the thing, you know, you, you write the book, you don't, while self-publishing is great because you can go direct to consumer, there's no one in the way to tell you, this isn't very good. It's not going to sell. Um, but if you do write a good book, if you do, then you get it edited, then you get it copy edited, then you get it proofread, then you get a cover, then you get it formatted, then you get it print formatted. And then you do your accounts and you have to do, well, I guess you're doing your accounts from the publisher anyway, but you know, all of that stuff is not easy, especially if you're doing it for the first time. The cool thing is there are a load of guides out there. There's a load of podcasts. Um, mine, there's another one, Creative Pen, uh, self-publishing podcast, Sell More Books show. It's really, there's this huge, you know, movement around showing people how to do this. And, you know, the first book, yeah, it's going to be a bit difficult. You might struggle to find an editor, struggle to find a cover design you like. But once you've done it once and twice, I think it becomes way easier and obviously, with all of these things comes cost. If you have a publisher, they're going to pay for stuff for you. Um, you know, they'll do your editing, they'll do your cover, all of that stuff. But even if you are looking at getting it really well done, like a really high-end editor, a really high-end cover designer, you're probably not going to pay more than $2,000. And that's, you know, a good amount to spend for what, you know, I've interviewed 85 people, it tends to come at around one to $2,000 to get a book out of the door. If you're self-publishing, can you still get it in a Barnes & Noble or a physical store? In a physical store, yes. In a Barnes & Noble, it's going to be more difficult. So you can send you know, print copies to local indie bookstores, but Barnes & Noble, has, it's going to be a, a much more difficult task. And what about if you're trying to get like a New York Times bestseller, do you need to go traditional publishing or can you... No way. It? Really? Uh, not at all. I know several authors. I mean, maybe... 10 of the authors, maybe 15 I've had on my show are New York Times bestselling authors with self-published books. It's just about getting on the New York Times is about selling a lot of books on several different platforms during one week. And if you can do that and you're a self-publisher, great. If you do that with a traditional publisher, great. It's, you know, there is kind of a rumor going around right now about whether they are, because, you know, it's all behind closed doors and, you know, traditional newspapers have ties to the traditional publishing world. So there's a lot of speculation about whether they're going to, you know, push against self-publishers being on the list, but it's all up in the air. It's all very speculative right now, but it's know. absolutely possible. Really? I don't know if you know the answer to this, but do you know how many copies in a week you need to sell to be on the New York Times bestseller? It totally depends on the time of year. 
um, which list you're going for. Because, uh, in fact, uh, a friend of mine who runs an excellent blog, uh, David Gochran, recently tried to do this with a couple of other authors. Like a big way for authors to hit uh, a New York Times list is they'll do a box set together. So you get five authors who all throw in their books to one set. And then that set will be, they'll discount the set and say 99 cents for like five books, full length books. And that will go out and they'll, all of those five authors will promote at the same time. And they'll be like, you know, buy this. It's awesome. It's the best deal you're going to get. Then, you know, a month later, this will be back at 2.99 for each individual book. Go out and buy it now. And then that will quickly climb in Amazon and then it'll get Amazon's attention. And a lot of a lot of book marketing in the Amazon world is about getting the attention of Amazon. So if you drive enough initial sales, you'll start rising up the, the bestseller ranks and then other people will see your book. You'll start appearing in something called also boughts, which are where, you know, if you're looking at a popular book and then you see, you know, that string of books underneath, if you can get in there of a popular book, that's really good. And if, you know, in the situation where you've got like five authors all pushing at once, this happens and then you they'll sell a lot of copies and that can be enough to trigger it but it is it is it's thousands um but as i said david gochran tried to do this a few months ago they didn't quite make it but if you could <laughs> i hate it when people come on my show and tell me to dig out things for the show notes but he goes into real depth about this and it's a really interesting process well, i wouldn't want to quote numbers because i wouldn't remember them actually yeah I'll, I'll add a link in the show notes for sure and then so my uh, follow up question to that is if you sell just Kindle versions of, of a book, you can still make it on the New York Times bestseller list? My understanding is you need to have across several platforms. So you'd need to sell, I mean, Amazon's the big one, especially in the United States, uh, the UK. Um, but in Canada, there's an ebook uh, bookseller called Kobo, which is the market leader there. And so you'd need to sell. I think you have to sell, again, I'm not certain, so take it with a pinch of salt, but my understanding is you have to sell a lot of books and then, you know, you have to hit these minimum thresholds on other platforms to show that it's not just one crazy day on Amazon or one crazy week on Amazon, but also you hit the, uh, you know, you, you made a dent in other retailers. Really interesting. All right, let's jump into some tips for the aspiring authors out there. And one problem I have is actually writing the book. Do you have any tips on how to write a good book? In terms of getting the words out or writing a quality book? Uh, let's start with getting the words out at first. Okay. Um, make a commitment to do it every day. The people who get the books done and are the most prolific, they will write seven days a week. It doesn't have to be some crazy ambitious goal. And this is something that I'm sure everyone listening has heard before, but it really, you know, I've done 85 hour long interviews. The people who are prolific do write every day and they just grind the words out. And if it's a bad day, it doesn't matter. It's not, there's no such thing as writer's block is something that comes up a lot. It's just you not wanting to write that day. So set a goal, whether it's a thousand, whether it's 4,000 and just sit down and then you multiply that by 30, you know, 30 days in a month. And suddenly you're looking at real numbers, you know, 30,000 or what? 120,000 words. And when you consider, I, I mostly focus on fiction authors on my show. What's a fiction book these days, 60 to 80, maybe a hundred thousand words at the high end. And suddenly that goal becomes pretty realistic. I mean, writing's it, writing it is only the, the first part of the process. The edits and uh, revisions and all of that stuff come later. But in terms of getting the words out, just making that daily commitment. There are, there are some other things you can use. There are a few cool tools. Um, one of them I'd really recommend is Scrivener, which is a, a writing program. And basically, unlike Word, you don't write in a kind of linear fashion or you don't have to. You have on the left, you have kind of they're like individual documents and you can drag them and move them around into a different order. So if you're, <laughs> one thing people often describe is, I can't write another meeting scene. If I write another, you know, where the characters go into some boring meeting to move the plot forward. And I just, they just don't want to write that today. And then they can move on to like an action scene. Or if you're writing a nonfiction book and you don't want to put together like the 10 step process, that's kind of more like a technical manual, but you'd rather write the motivational bit that's coming up in chapter three, you can just jump into your structure and jump into chapter three and get your words done by going into there. I mean, and then there's a there's another great app which I was recently turned on to, which is quite masochistic, I guess. It's called Write or Die. Um, it's free, but there is a software you can download. And basically, you have to keep typing, or it'll start flashing red, it'll make all these crazy sounds. And then there's something called kamikaze mode, where if you don't stop writing, it'll start deleting your word. If you do yeah, if you, if you pause for like a long enough time, it starts deleting the words. And so you're like, oh, okay, carry on, got to write, got to write. 
Yeah, oh it's my pretty intense. gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. One, one method I heard that sounded really interesting to me, and I don't know if you've heard about this, is basically you bullet point out whatever your, talk, whatever your book is about. And maybe it's more with nonfiction type books. And then you just go back and you record yourself talking about all the points. Get somebody to uh, transcribe your recordings into actual words and then kind of edit from there. Have you ever heard of somebody doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve Scott's, I think... Was it, maybe it was Steve Scott I heard about this first from or, or someone else. But yeah, absolutely. I think drawing out that plan, because I wrote my first nonfiction book last year and it took ages and I didn't know what I was doing. And then it needed a massive edit. And then that takes you know way longer than actually writing the book in the first place. This time around, I'm writing another one now. I'm like, I'm going to make it shorter. You know, It's going to be less than 20,000 words, but I'm going to fully structure it. And those 20,000 words are not going to come from me starting at the beginning. They're just going to be from me you know, writing 3,000 words of bullet points and then expanding all of those bullet points from 20 words to 50 words and then going through and expanding those as necessary and kind of just having it really tightly structured and then just growing everything from there so you don't go back and be like, oh no, chapter one and chapter three need to be in the same chapter, which is uh, a headache. <laughs> yeah, because I... Like, for instance, with the podcast, I always write out bullet points and then just kind of expand upon that. And I imagine if we were to type out an hour long episode for a podcast, it would take, you know, a week or two. Have you done it? (laughs) No, no, I have not. Uh, I'm not a amazing writer, but I feel like when I talk, I'm a little bit more fluent than I am when I type, if that makes sense. So that's something I've always been interested in because I plan on eventually trying to write a book, but I don't know if I could sit there and type 2000 words a day. I think it's it's a matter of practice for sure, but doing the I mean it's not I I I wouldn't really call it ghostwriting when you basically come up with all of the stuff yourself, but yeah, kind of bringing in almost like to edit your thoughts into something that's coherent. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a smart way of getting out a book if you don't want to sit down and write 2000 words a day. <laughs> Or uh, even if you do, it's it's efficient. Yeah. So now let's say that the the listeners have all the content there ready to go. How do you go about getting an editor? Or wh- what's the next step, I guess, once you have all those words down on paper? I think this editor probably would come a bit later. Um, once you've got them all down, you definitely want to read through it a few times. Because if you self-edit, it's going to be easier for your editor. And if it's easier for your editor, it's cheaper for you. <laughs> so if you can go through and clean it up as much as you can absolutely do that. I mean, you can just hand it off straight away to an editor, but they'll come back with revisions for you to make because an editor doesn't just take the work and make it perfect. They'll come back with a really marked up thing, kind of lots of digital red pen everywhere, asking questions, telling you about this. And if they, if you have an error in your first chapter, they're not going to correct it through the whole book. They're just going to correct it in the first chapter and be like, apply to rest of book. So it's not, I mean, maybe there are editors who do totally polish something and make it clean, but I haven't come across them. But I'm sure they're expensive too. Yeah, I'm sure they're really expensive. But um, yeah, so you would definitely want to go through it a few times, make sure you've got all the, all the mistakes that you can catch. And then you can even send it to beta readers before you get it edited. So if you want people to give you an idea, you know, tell them, listen, this isn't edited. It's pretty rough. Someone you trust, but also someone who's going to give you an honest opinion if you've written something terrible (laughs) and say, what do you think? Because if you send a book that's not really hitting what your market wants and send it to an editor, you're going to pay a lot of money to have something edited that people don't want. So there is, especially with your first book to send, like I definitely sent mine to beta readers before I sent it to my editor and I changed it a ton before it even went to the editor. So the, the beta readers are basically just friends and family, correct? Uh, yeah, but be careful because your mom's going to tell you it's awesome, whatever is happening. So uh, yeah, maybe like a brother or you know someone who would tell it, give it to you straight. <laughs> yeah, I think I have friends that are like that where they're not going to be mean, but at the same time, they're not going to hold back the punches, you know? Yeah, exactly. I think that's, I think that's really important because you don't want to have the wool pulled over your eyes and your editor's not paid to tell. I mean, they'll, they'll tell you if the books, you know, the problems with the book, but they, they're not going to tell you it's a terrible book or you've completely missed the mark. That's not their job. Their job is to take what you've made and, and polish it and, and, and make it as good as it can be. So I think that beta reading step is, is important. And then, yeah, take your beta reader feedback into account, then go out and get an editor. And in terms of finding an editor, You've got to be really careful. I have a couple of episodes on this. And if people did want to check that out, it's uh, really worth doing because it's super expensive and you don't want to get someone who either isn't a fit for you 
is just looking to take your money um, because there are plenty of sharks out there. Um, there's a couple of places to start. Kboards.com is a really popular forum for writers, more fiction writers, but there are editors on there and they will edit both fiction and nonfiction. And yeah, if you can get a referral, like some, someone you know who's worked with an editor who's good and affordable, you know, definitely check into them. And also, if, if you don't, that's fine. Find an editor who's got a good reputation online. Talk to people they've edited with before. They'll be happy to provide references if they're any good. And also ask for a sample. I mean, maybe a few pages. Take it from the middle of your manuscript, though. Don't take it from the first chapter because that's probably your best chapter. And send those pages off. Get them to have an edit of it. And if you like what they're doing, also don't let it just be an email relationship. Get on Skype with them. Because this is the thing, you're paying them a lot of money. They expect to have a, have, a, have a relationship with you, have contact with you. So get on a Skype call and make sure that they're someone you'd like to work with because it will be a, you know, a pretty close relationship for the, for the few weeks that you edit. And then after your book's all edited and ready to go, what's the next step? It depends what you, how you want to distribute. Like you can go Amazon Select where you just go with Amazon. And I've done that right now for my first 90 days partly because there are certain benefits of it. You can be in, oh, people argue whether it's a benefit of being in something called Kindle Unlimited, which is basically where I'm sure people might have heard of this from the consumer perspective, where you can, for I think it's about $9.99 a month, you can borrow as many books as you want, but those are books that are in Kindle Select. And I wanted to be a part of that just for exposure. And also, I'm pretty happy to give away my book to, well, not give away, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lower price for people and I get a lower royalty, but I want the book to be out there for people. It's not a crazy big money maker for me. It's more kind of just, a, I like having it as, a, as an addition to the podcast and hopefully draw more people to the podcast. And, and yeah, so if you want to be an Amazon, it's, it's pretty easy. You need to do something called formatting. This is, again, another place you're probably going to spend money, but you can do this yourself. It's not like editing and cover design, don't do it yourself. I mean, if you don't feel you need, I mean, there's different levels of editing. So you can pay for a high level editor, which is really expensive, or you can pay for just a copy editor, someone to clean up your mistakes, kind of just a little bit above a proofreader. And then cover design you should pay for because the cover is the most important thing, perhaps even more important than the title of selling your book. Um, That little thumbnail really makes a difference. And then the, but the formatting, basically it takes your manuscript and it makes it into a format that people, that Amazon will understand and that will be neat on people's Kindles. So if you've got tables, if you've got, you know, it will get the spacing right, it'll put a table of contents in. And that's a hassle to learn. And honestly, it's like $50. So I would totally just find someone who knows how to format a book, maybe $100 max if it's a simple book. For the cover, do you have any recommendations on making a good cover or how to find people to do it? Don't make it yourself um, unless you are a designer, um, as I said. Uh, but I, I mostly know fiction cover designers. Uh, there's a chap who um, is a friend of mine who does rocking book covers. He's mostly, he, I think he does some nonfiction, but excellent, excellent fiction book covers. Okay, so you just oh, found and, uh, friends I should friends? mention He was actually a member of the Dynamite Circle. Oh, okay. And uh, Derek Murphy is another good one at Creative Indie. He does, he does a lot of nonfiction, really good stuff. How do you feel about 99 Designs? Well, I did a cover with them because um, they sponsored my show, and, but not currently. So uh, I, can, I will give my honest opinion. I, I mean, I love my cover. I think it was, I kind of sent them a few covers that I like. And I said, I want something like this, maybe a bit darker. And then I got plenty of designs come in and yeah, it was $300, I think. And it was, I, I couldn't be more pleased with it, to be honest. And for the next books, I'm kind of, the book I did write is called Audiobooks for Indies. And it's all about turning um, your self-published book into an audiobook and kind of like best practices, easiest way to get that done, your different financial options and all of that stuff. But I'm going to do several more books in a series called For Indie. So the next one's coming up is, is Hacking Costs for Indie. So it's like, how can I get an edif- editor for less? And I was just saying, you know, self-edit as much as you can. Um, where can I get a cover for less? And, you know, you might pay $300 for a good cover through 99designs. But also there's designers out there who do something called pre-made covers, which can be less than $50 and look awesome. You know, this person would normally charge 300 400 bucks for a cover, but they'll kind of give away ones that they've pre-made for giveaway <laughs> at forty dollars it's it feels like it i mean uh, adrius who does rocking book covers really talented designer charges hundreds of dollars for like a 
customized cover, but he has, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 covers on his site that you can just go pick up for, I think it's like, it's less than $50 or it used to be. Maybe his prices have gone up now. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So at but this- 99 Designs I thought was great. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, it sounds like we have all we need to basically release the book. The next step would be marketing the book. What have you found to be like kind of the 80-20 of the marketing? Like if you could only focus on one or two ways to market your book, what would they be? There's a couple of major, as I mentioned earlier, getting Amazon's, again, focusing on Amazon here, it's, it's what I know best and it's the biggest retailer in the US, um, is getting the attention of Amazon is really important. So the best way to sell books is not to people you know, it's not to your audience, it's not to anything like that. It's, it's to people you don't know and Amazon is going to be the one to put your book in front of people. Having a platform is awesome because it allows you to launch a book. And you can say, hey, my book is out, go and buy it, go and review it. But really, you know, even if you've got a mailing list with 5,000 people on it and they buy all of them, 100% of them buy your book, if your book's like four bucks, you're not going to really make a fortune. And that's it. They're not going to buy it twice. And it's crazy to think that 100% of your mailing list is even going <laughs> to open, open it, up the email. click yeah. it, yeah. go to the site, buy. What are you talking about? Maybe 10% absolute tops. So you're never going to make the, you know, you're not going to make a fortune from there. So use that to get in Amazon's attention and, and move up your subcategory. So for example, mine would be in, I think it's in writing skills, which is weird or um, kind of the, that, those sort of subcategories. And then it will rank there. Other people will discover it. Most importantly, it's getting ranked. Uh, it's getting in those also boughts of people who've written books similar to mine. So there's other podcasters, other bloggers in the space who have put out books that are handy for indie authors. I mentioned a few people previously, uh, Joanna Penn, David Gochran, who've put out books. And then because people are buying their book, and then they're also buying my book, probably because they listen to both of our podcasts and stuff, then I start appearing in those books also bought. And people are like, huh, audiobooks, I'm into that. They click on it, they buy it. That's, you know, Amazon's where you want to go. But okay, so say you don't have a mailing list, so you don't have an audience. Few ways you can do it. There's There's... These sites basically that are email lists for rent. So the big one is a site called BookBub, uh, Book B U B, and they have it's got to be like over a hundred k on some of their lists now. Uh, and they do they do nonfiction as well as fiction. But I know like mysteries or something. They had like a hundred thousand people, and for a few hundred dollars, you can send to them about a promotional book. So say your book's like three ninety nine, and you drop it to ninety nine cents for two days. And you try and get, and I say try because it's like everyone wants to be on it and it's really competitive. So you can try and give them some money to promote your book. And then they will send uh, a, a, an email saying, you know, this book is normally four ninety nine. It's now 99 cents to 80,000 people, which makes it go nuts. And pretty much it seems, you know, the figures are all on their sites about whether you make your money back from spending the few hundred dollars on doing the book, Bob Ad, it's, it's really the leader in the market for promoting books right now. There are a few others. You can look around on Fiverr. There's one called BK Nights. There's another one called Book Sends, um, which is not a Fiverr gig. That's a, that's a separate site. Fussy Librarian, similar to BookBub, kind of, you know, the also rands, but still can really move the needle. But these are um, for people who don't have a mailing list, or if you do have a mailing list, you should totally use those as well. <laughs> From the interviews that you've done, do you see that there's certain types of marketing that people tend to ignore that you think is extremely important? I think there's more a lot of types of marketing that people think is important that really isn't. I I don't want to like bring it down, but this is really a digital world, and people still will go to book signings. And I think that's great. And I think, but if you're, if you're doing it to shift books, it's probably not going to move the ebook needle. But if you're doing it because that's cool and yeah, it's great to speak at a conference and have your book at the back of the room if you're a nonfiction author or if you, you know, you want to go to your local coffee shop and set up a stand, I think that's awesome. But it's not, it's probably not going to, going to shift books. In terms of things people aren't doing, I think there's been a, what's really cool is people who aren't really into the internet marketing side of things are really starting to listen to these podcasts, are really starting to listen to these blogs and pick up on things like mailing lists. And this wasn't something that was particularly huge for fiction authors before, but now it's like, should really start a mailing list, should really like get people onto these things. So when I put out my next book, I can tell them about it and they can buy it and I can build a fan base. I can build people who will beta read for me, who will leave me a great review on day one and all of this stuff. And it's really interesting to see that come across. 
do you get a lot of fiction readers that go from podcast to podcast? Because I know that's extremely common with nonfiction writers where they go to as many podcasts as possible to try to promote their book. Does that happen? No. No. And there's a really good reason why, because the people who come on my show, yeah, they'll have a fiction book, but my audience aren't fiction readers. I mean, they'll read fiction like any person or probably more because they're an author, but they're not there to hear about someone's book. They're here to, there to hear about their writing and marketing advice. So there's not really the connect between the guests and the audience having something to buy. Now, there are cases, of course, when someone comes on and is like, I have written this book for authors. And yeah, they, there'll be, there is a certain amount of kind of podcast and blog touring, but not like you'll see in the kind of management and marketing podcasts I found. That's interesting. Now, obviously, you've done a lot of episodes. What would you say some of the biggest things that you've learned from interviewing all these different authors? Any tips you'd give to an aspiring writer out there? It sounds really boring uh, <laughs> because it's the same advice you hear everywhere. It's just like, make sure, you know, you, you've got to put in a lot of time. And this is something I hear and it's not sexy or anything. It's just the people who are really successful have been working really hard and really smart. Like they plan their books. They plan what they're going to do. They plan their series. They plan who their market is. And they take a very business-like attitude towards it. There is this enormously important and it is incredibly obvious in in some of the very successful authors that i interview that they see this you know writing the book is one thing selling the book is something completely else and they are very good at separating art or you know art which they would then go to the business side of things and then call production and they separate these and i think that's a mindset that's really important to embrace and it's definitely a correlation between these the, the superstars I completely agree. I actually just recorded an episode with somebody and we were talking about how a lot of times the artist isn't good at selling their art and vice versa. The guy that's really good at selling isn't good at creating. I think that that is an extremely important distinction to be able to make within yourself. It's take the take one hat off and put the other one on, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And Simon, before we wrap things up, I'm really inspired by your life. I know that you recently, you were doing freelancing for a little while, recently quit that and did full time. You have a YouTube channel, you have a podcast. Any advice for the 20-somethings out there listening to this on how to live, how to live their life? Yeah, I've got something. Um, I start, kind of kicked this all off full-time, quit freelancing about, it's got to be less than 18 months ago. And it feels like it's been a really long time because, I mean, I, I feel like I grew this podcast. I grew another podcast. I grew this YouTube channel and all of this stuff. And it just feels like, it feels like in a flash, but also a really long time. And someone... I, but I still feel like there's so much progress to be made. And someone, in fact, it was one of the people I mentioned earlier. I'm not sure if she was the first person to say this, but it was don't look at things in, you know, don't look back at the last 18 months. Look back in four-year increments and look forward in four-year increments. And I kind of was like, huh? But then it's like this, you, you can look back a year and it doesn't seem that that much has changed. But if you look back four years, it gets really crazy. And it's not that huge amount of time. And if you look four, four years ago, I hadn't even heard, you know, I'd never, I wouldn't even considered freelancing. I was just traveling after university. And, and I look at myself now and I'm like, never would have guessed. And I'm amazed. And just looking forward four years, it makes me think, wow, what, what on earth could happen? And looking forward a year, you're like, ah, what will happen? But it's not, it's never that kind of crazy change. I just love that idea of looking at four year blocks. It's, Yeah. That's crazy because that's spot on with me. About four years ago from right around today, I just had graduated college and started my new job. And I had no idea that two years from that point, I'd be quitting my job. And then two years from that point, I'd be where I'm at now with a successful online business, a podcast and all this kind of stuff. I really like that advice. I can't imagine four years from now. Yeah, exactly. And, and the forward looking thing is just as, as important. You know, you look back and you're like, everything could change. And I mean, change for the better, for sure. <laughs> That is awesome. Just we'll where will you be? Yeah, Simon, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Been a pleasure. That was a lot of information and a really fun episode for me to do. I really enjoyed talking with Simon. Not only does he have an amazing voice, but he actually has a lot of knowledge on how to do self-publishing. You can check him out, of course, at Rocking Self-Publishing. And I'll put the link in the show notes, as I said, for his special link that he set up. And guys, if you have a goal, really any type of goal, but maybe, for instance, writing a book highly recommend you go to the my website, howtodoyour20s.com. Sign up to be VIP. It's totally free. And I'll send you 
an email that includes the hidden episode that I did where I took all the science about how to set and achieve your goals and I put it into one distilled episode. I think it's so cool when you can use science to accomplish something that you really want. And I, I've talked about this before, but our brains aren't that different from a golden retriever as far as it comes to motivation. It's like, how do you get a dog to do something? It's very similar to how you get yourself to do something. And I think people want to think that, oh, you know what, I'll just, if I want something, I'll do it. But you know, every January 1st, people are proved wrong on that because how often have you set goals and not achieved them? Well, you don't need to be like that. You don't need to keep failing with your goals. And there's a lot of little tips and tricks that I have that I did in that episode. So go to how to do your twenties.com, put your email in the box, become VIP totally for free. And I'll send you that episode. Once again, if you're on Twitter, follow me at Travis Mars. It's Travis M-A-R-Z. And I send out like anytime I find something cool on the internet, maybe a cool podcast or a cool scientific article, I'll tweet about it. And it'd be great to tweet with some of you guys to connect and send some messages back and forth. But lastly, I release a new episode every Monday. So I hope to see you guys next Monday for another great and inspiring episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, make sure you hit the big red subscribe button down below. You can also check me out on Facebook and on Twitter. And I release a new video every Monday. And by hitting that subscribe button, you'll get those new videos every Monday. And this is really a podcast. It's also a website. You can check out the website. It's howtodoyour20s.com. I'll put a link right over here as well. And what it's all about is trying to improve your life. And we specifically focus on things that people in their 20s are interested in. So make sure you like the video if you liked it. Subscribe. Like us on Facebook and Twitter, whatever. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope to see you again on another video.